district, you know the Pope listens. Dynasty, our religion, for the blokes missing. On all of these trades, on all of these plays, on all of these grades. By the end of the day, y'all getting played. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex? Send the homie a text? That trash offers the best? You try to make it complex? Then they text you back, now all of a sudden they don't make any sense? <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy. Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy. These trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G O A T District, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's the and I always be trading, 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 and I always be trading, trading. And I always be trading. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Bait them, bait them. Fish. 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 Welcome, Fantasyland. We are back again, and we are trying a. Oh, it looks like we're live, guys. You know what? Well, why not? Let's just do it. Do it. Let's just do it live. Why not? Um. So, Dan. Before we uh, we get to our guests, I, it, it's different doing vi- visual because I can't even like you know tease the audience. It's they, they just see him on there. But I got to ask you about your trip, man. You uh, you were out there in the wilderness with the girls last week, and I want to I want to hear a bit about it. Yeah, so it was uh, it was a little bit shorter trip than usual uh, in in amount of time. Uh, still went a pretty good distance. We went uh, about forty five miles um, down a, a river that's. Fairly wildish, um, you know. There's some cabins along the way and things like that, but uh, you know, for the most part, when you're on the river, you're you're on your own. Um, campsites few and far between. You whatever you have with you or whatever you bring is what you have. I mean, you know, there's no anything, you know, at the campsites or anything like that. I mean, you know, you've no electricity, no nothing. So, uh, you know, if you want it, you brought it with you. Um, uh, some couple of heavy duty portages to start in the trip. We had a, a mile one pretty early into the trip and one that was about three quarters of a mile later in the trip. Um, uh, and it was, uh, the weather was not great. <laughs> we had a lot of rain and, uh, some pretty good wind too. So it was a little bit more of a challenge than we were hoping for, but, uh, it was still fun. Uh, you know, there's nothing better than spending uh, five days with my girls and they just, they love the challenge of it. So we had, we had a great time despite that. Nice. Glad you guys uh, made it back and and had a good time despite the weather. One of one of these guys is, has been on now a few times. I think Bobby's been on. You've been on what a couple of times now, Bobby? I'm not quite at the five timers club yet, which I've got into <laughs> a few other podcasts. I still need a few more times before I get that jacket. I'm waiting on. It. I think you automatically get a badge sent to you when that when that happens. I'm pretty sure we have that set up somehow. Yeah. Well, we, we appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know uh, the, the lady's not do, uh, feeling that well tonight, so we appreciate you taking a bit of time with us uh, and squeezing us in. And uh, we bring your buddy in. You, you told me that you're not a zookeeper, but you, you know, you, you kinda, you're kind of the zookeeper on, on the, the Zooperflex, right? Matt Go has ahead. actually been a zookeeper for a long time, so I don't feel appropriate taking that title. If he wants to call me an honorary zookeeper, I guess I'll accept it. I have, I will say one thing from that show is I've learned a lot of random animal facts because I actually pay attention when Matt talks, believe it or not. And so <laughs> I'll be watching like Jeopardy and something will come up about like Okapis, for example, and I'll be able to answer it. And my family's like, where did he learn that? And I'll be like, well, <laughs> it's kind of a weird story, but I host a podcast with a senior zookeeper at the San Diego Zoo. And then they're just like, okay, that's weird, but cool that you're learning. Yeah, no, no. And that's kind of the parallel I was going to make. I know he's 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 the official, the actual zookeeper. zookeeper. And uh, Mr. Matt Price, uh, welcome to the GOAT District, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, Bobby, I did say that you could be the honorary zookeeper, but then today I was thinking about it. And I remembered how you're afraid of basically every single animal on the planet. <laughs> So I, I think not being afraid of animals is probably a prerequisite. So I'm, I might have to strip you of that title, unfortunately. That's completely fair. I think <laughs> that if you tried to get me to feed anything larger than a dog, I'd probably just run away. So, <laughs> Bobby, I know last time you came on, you were kind of in, in the in transition uh, career wise. So I just want to just want to check in and see how the new gig's going. Uh, yeah, it's going really well. Um, 
I was saying this to one of my friends the other day. Believe it or not, there are companies out there that actually treat their employees well. It's uh, shocking. <laughs> I have never had that experience before. Uh, hopefully, I doubt anyone from my old job actually listens to this. But if you do, you probably know what I'm talking about. Most of you are not there anymore anyway. Uh, so yeah, it's great. And I'm really happy to be in the new position. And it's nice to see all the work that I put in in the grad school pay off maybe one day. I'll be able to afford a car as nice as Dan's. If you haven't seen Dan's car, (laughs) make sure you check that out. I mean, uh, it's kind of like coming out of that relationship where where you maybe you weren't treating so well. And then uh, Mm -hmm. you find that person that uh, is on the other end of the spectrum and you maybe appreciate it a bit more. So I'm glad to see that you're back on track and uh, feeling uh, appreciated. Matt, I didn't give you the proper intro, man. You, uh, I, I told you earlier, just hearing your voice, to me, there, there's like a, a comfort almost to it because I've listened to you for so long. And uh, you are the DLF uh, senior writer over there on one of my favorite sites that, and, you know, a host of one of my favorite podcasts with regards to the DLF Dynasty podcast. And it's kind of like what I told Izzy when he came on and JP. Uh, you guys, uh, you know, are kind of the uh, inspiration behind the GOAT district because I'd finish the pod, you know, the epi, and I'd be like, man, I want to hear more. You know, I want to hear more about player value and, and trades and, and all the good stuff. So I uh, appreciate you coming on tonight and, and taking time with us as well. Yeah, that's uh, really nice of you to say. Uh, I have a very hard time accepting praise in general. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. I feel like I'm still nobody in this industry. I'm just happy to be, you know, be in the room where it all happens and get to talk to, to Dan and Ryan all the uh, every week. You know, uh, Ryan obviously is he is dynasty fantasy football right so to be able to have the access to him and 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 really to be able to call him a friend at this point uh has been really awesome so i appreciate all the kind words though bobby i'm gonna go back to you because i heard recently i don't know if it was on the the super flex that i heard it but you recently dropped pop and juice which are two things that i just probably haven't had in a couple of decades but uh how's how's that going for you man Wow, we're really just getting into the entire details of our personal lives, huh? <laughs> I, guess, I guess at this point, I should also note that I am closing on a house on Monday. So now nice. everyone just knows exactly what's going on. <laughs> nice. we, we, um, we just need access to your latest physical, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bank account uh, info. It's going pretty well. I've uh, Since we're getting, we're, we're getting nice and personal here, I've dropped uh, eight pounds since the beginning of July. So nice. I'm pretty That's happy awesome, with man. that. Good for yeah, it was just one of those things that, uh, you know, speaking of the job and the house and whatever, I'd reached a bunch of other personal goals of mine. And I've been talking for years about getting in better physical shape, but just kind of kept putting it off. But it remained one of the few goals that it felt like, OK, I haven't accomplished this yet. And I've accomplished a bunch of others. Probably time to dedicate some time. I will say growing up the son of a baker who my mom owned a bakery for 20 years, it's really hard to give up dessert and sugar. But and so the first week or so was rough, but that, since then I've been doing pretty well and appreciate you asking. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I, I found it interesting because I always think for uh, someone who wants something that's not, you know, it's easy for me to say it's not, it's not uh, difficult, but you know, it's kind of a, a small step that you can take is eliminating, you know, the juices and the pops and, and it'll, it makes a pretty significant difference. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, since we're getting personal, I got one more for, for Matt. I want to know from one to 10, like how scared are you to have a new roommate, buddy, <laughs> coming in? <laughs> yeah, here we go. Personal information. Uh, my, uh, my my girlfriend of about a year now is is, is moving in, just kind of worked out timing wise where uh, her landlord is selling her house and my roommate's lease is up. So uh, we're taking the taking the jump. I'm excited, but certainly nervous about it. Uh, it, it before the roommate, I lived by myself for, for a while and that was really nice and it seems like that's not going to happen again <laughs> anytime soon uh so but no i'm really excited about it uh we're I, i'm kind of crazy about her so uh i'm excited but you know nervous it's a it's a big step man for sure yeah. for can sure. i just jump in real quick and say that i'm happy that matt's doing this because i got the opportunity to meet his girlfriend and if he messed this up i probably would have had to fire him from our show <laughs> it was just some horrible decision making <laughs> Uh, I know hilarious. what lie I need to tell that now if I ever want that to get was, out of that show. That was, that was one of the most roundabout compliments I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I got a quick, quick animal question for you guys before we get into the goodness. And and if you guys have said this, you know, recently somewhere and I just haven't heard it, I apologize. But I'll go to Matt first since you are the zookeeper. What's your favorite animal if you have one? 
Uh, I have, I mean, it's hard. I love, I mean, most animals, but I guess if I had to pick an absolute favorite, it would be polar bears. That's kind of the species that, you know, as a young, as a young kid really like made me want to work with animals. Um, and you know, I've gotten to do that now for, for about a decade and, uh, they're, they're awesome, but I love lots of stuff too. Like, you know, uh, I love the ones that are lesser known, like tapers. Not many people know a lot about tapers. They're probably my favorite, uh, herbivore animal. I'm work- working with some main wolves right now that are really awesome. So, uh, I-, I like most of them, but if I had to pick one, probably polar bears. It's funny you mentioned that. Cause when I was a kid, that was my, I don't know what it is with kids and polar bears, but th- that's, <laughs> that was, that was my go-to when I was, when I was a young child, Bobby, how about you, man? So, I mean, I love dogs, but I know that's not the answer you're looking for. Cause I always say on our show, non-domestic animals, cause dogs have always been a huge part of my life. It's going to be a boring answer, but much like you guys, when I was a kid, I had a polar bear toy and I actually made a cape for it and I called it super bear. And I flew it into another kid's diorama cause it was a cave. And I thought, oh, this makes sense. And then I destroyed their diorama. So just a quick <laughs> backstory there. Um, <laughs> But uh, I've always kind of loved polar bears and like Matt, uh, I didn't go into zookeeping because of it, but I have donated to charities related to helping polar bears. And now that's extended out to more just in general extinct or going extinct animals. Dan, you're going to make this like a, like a sweep with the polar bear or what? Can I, can I say polar bear? Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, it's it's tough for me to pick a favorite. I mean, I've I've always enjoyed uh you know all, almost all the animals. I mean, I you know I've enjoyed learning about them. Uh, I, I love going to zoos. You know, it's something that interested me. Like most other kids, you know, you you, you want to find out about the cool animals and all that. And it always seemed to me like Africa had the most cool animals. And then you know, if you start looking at the animals in North America without the you know with the idea that you'd never seen these things before, you realize we have just as many cool animals as Africa. It's just you know that we're used to them. But my, my favorite is probably right now, I would say, uh, the moose, just because it's a, it's such a symbol of uh, the area I love, you know, <laughs> northern Minnesota, Ontario. Good old Canadian you know, when boy, you, when, you see, when you see When you see moose, you know you're north. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a little... They're a little bit more um, sensitive to the environment than a lot of people give them credit for. So they're they're also a little bit of a telltale for the, uh, hey, there you go, Paul Bunyan. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just going to say they're also really rare. Not, I guess not really rare, but they're fairly rare in zoos as well. Uh, mm-hmm. One of my b- best friends is uh, a VP of animal operations at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado, which is an incredible zoo, maybe my favorite zoo I've ever been to. It's up on a mountain. The views are just incredible. But he, his job last week was to drive to Alaska to pick up an eight-week-old moose and then drive it back to Colorado and has been bottle feeding it for the last wow. couple of weeks and stuff like that. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah, moose are awesome. That's actually a good point. Yeah, you don't really see them often in, in a zoo. That's a really good point. Yep, yep. All right, guys, let's get into the goodness. We got personal. We talked animals. We talked about <laughs> Dan's trip. We, got, we, talked, we, we, we went around the globe there. So, Well, real quick, JD, I did have something to say about Dan's trip. He took that trip because he wanted to make sure his girls saw him at least one last time and <laughs> how respected him. Because once they see him in jorts, it's over. Well, you know... <laughs> If you've seen my camping clothes, the jorts are probably a step up from that. <laughs> <laughs> I should have kept the I'm, air horn for that I'm one. Just, yeah, I'm just going to say, uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they've probably seen worse. <laughs> that sounds like an awesome, awesome trip, though, Dan. I, I'm a big hiker camper, too. I've never done it with with uh, canoeing, though. That sounds incredible. I have a Jeep, so I like to drive out in the middle of nowhere. Like, to me, camping is not. I mean, there's, there's there's definitely a place for camping in like a campground with a bunch of people mm-hmm. and drinking and loud music and stuff. But for me, camping is to drive out where there's nobody else and and you know just kind of be by yourself in nature. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so much fun. As we get into the goodness, uh, last week we had the uh, the red shirt guys on here, Matt and Matt Betts and uh, Okada. Go back and listen to it. A lot of great information on injuries and tight ends. Initially, I, I, you know, Dan and I talked and we were, we were looking at doing positions, but so I'm going to tie it in with the tight, tight end because I do want to talk to Matt about an article he recently dropped and then uh, we'll get into a, a receiver, but we're, we're not going to limit it to position this week just because I feel like we have a nice mix with our guests and uh, I don't want to limit the discussion. So I'm going to start with you, Matt. We had... Um, uh, Dave Richard from CBS on here, and he he was a big fan of of this offense out in Denver. And I know myself, Fant is 
you know, I, I'll let you talk about your article, but I read it and it, and it, it articulates really well how I feel about the player. So, you know, let, let the people know uh, where, the, where they can find it because y- you put out some amazing material. Uh, this is one example of it. It's a great article out there on DLF. And uh, let the people know maybe what uh, conclusion you came to with the article. Yeah, this is uh, a new series that DLF started putting out uh, recently. I think there's maybe three, two, two or three more in addition to mine on Noah Fant. Uh, and basically, we're just talking about if we think this particular player is going to break out in 2020 or if he's a kind of a fake out and, you know, maybe not quite worth the price. Uh, and I guess I'll start start with the with the spoiler alert, I guess, uh, and that, that's that I think he is a fake out uh, for a few different reasons. Um, I do I definitely like the player. He was my tight end one last year in that rookie class, you know, just over over TJ Hawkinson, um, and I probably still probably prefer him a little bit over Hawkinson um, just because of health issues and you know um, some other things with Hawk, but. Uh, I do think he's a fake out mostly because of of the offense that he's in and the, and the players around him. So the the the, the kind of the hop- hypothesis for this article, and I, I kind of made an ar- arbitrary cutoff because you got to make a cut cutoff somewhere. And I've always kind of felt like, and I think the numbers bear out that to be a back half tight end one is is really not that impressive, right? You can find these back half tight end ones anywhere. If you if you catch one pass for one for a touchdown, you're probably going to be a back half tight end one on the week, right? So for for the for this for this particular article. Article of categorization was if Noah Prant fan is going to be called a breakout in 2020, he needs to finish as a top top six tight end. Um, and I just can't see that happening with the weapons they have there. You know, we have still have questions about Drew Locke, who's a great deep ball thrower, but you know, he doesn't really hit those uh, those those the short intermediate passes very well, uh, which is weird. It seems like those should be the easier thing for a quarterback to do, right? But for some some reason, he is he struggled with that in his first season. So uh, and and you know, that's where a lot of the targets for the tight ends are going to go a fan does have the athleticism to get deep and you know he showed that last year absolutely um so he could have that if he catches a few long touchdowns and he could absolutely be a top six tight end uh, next year but just looking at the last four seasons uh, of, of data of what we've seen from from tight ends, it, it doesn't really seem like Fant can get there uh, because uh, out of uh, 24 total op- opportunities over the last four seasons to be a top six tight end, 67 percent or 16 of them led their team in targets, and then an additional 29 percent or seven were second in, on their team in targets. And then, you know, just 4% or one tight end, Austin Hooper, was outside of the top two targets to finish as a top six tight end. And with the addition of Jerry Judy, you know, I just I I cannot see Fant eclipsing Jerry Judy in targets, even in a rookie season where he's going to be compromised with with the COVID situation and not getting into the game plan and all that noise. But I, I can't see them not wanting to get him a heavy dose of targets. Last season, Fant was was second on the team in targets, but it was, you know, a far cry from what Cortland Sutton had. It was 120-ish targets, I believe, and Fant was in the mid-60s. So while he had that, it was, it, I mean, there was literally nobody else to really catch the ball. Deshaun Hamilton was a disappointment. Uh, all the d- tight ends they have drafted before him were disappointments, right? Uh, moved on from Emmanuel Sanders. So he was literally only the, the, the only second target they had. You know, and then and we want to stretch it out a little bit more, uh, you know, I, I think that Albert O is a little bit underrated, obviously a very athletic tight end in his own right, has a connection played with Drew Locke in college where he caught, uh, I think it was 17 touchdowns over the two seasons with him. So he's absolutely a touchdown threat uh, and could be that in year one if they're able to kind of restore that chemistry. Uh, so fan could lose some touchdowns from there. He's going to lose targets for Judy. He's, in my opinion, I think he's at best third in the pecking order for targets. And, you know, I think you can make a case for Melvin Gordon in there somewhere as well, you know, a very good receiving back. So I just I, based on his price right now, which is tight end seven in July ADP. I mean, you, you, this is dynasty, right? So he doesn't have to hit a top six tight end next season necessarily. But what's his situation is not going to change, right? If Drew Locke is good, then sure, he'll be there. But if he's not, we're going to be starting with another new quarterback and Jerry Judy and, and Cortland Sutton. They're not going anywhere. So I just don't see him being able to hit that, you know, the, the, that threshold of being a top receiver of targets in an in that offense or the second best uh, the second most targets on offense for really you know basically the entire rookie contract right so for me paying a tight end seven price for Noah fan is just a little bit too much yeah if I had referred to my notes when I asked you that question I would have that's what I would have focused in on I, I loved how you uh, approached it with regards to the you know what uh, pecking order they are on on their rightful team with regards to targets and that's something that I think sometimes we miss when we're looking at uh, some of these guys and what their upside can be and that 
offense is definitely an example with all the weapons. Bobby, how do you feel? I think last time I saw anything come out from you with regards to this offense, it wasn't the biggest confidence for Locke. Am I right? So I'm pretty sure I've become known on Twitter as president of the <laughs> anti-Lock fan club. <laughs> you know, it's we've talked about this pretty at much ad nauseum on our show, so I won't go too much into it. But I'm not a big believer. I haven't been a big believer from his college days. And I think that people, as much as they want to say it's something else, I think people are getting excited by the fact that he won some games as a rookie, but that doesn't really matter for fantasy. His fantasy stats were not great. And I see him as being possibly a good, actual, real NFL quarterback, like a game manager type, but not good for fantasy purposes. And because of that, I'm not really all that interested in anyone that's not named Judy or Sutton. And even with Judy and Sutton both being there, I'm a little skeptical of that offense on the whole. Dan, we've talked about this offense a couple of times um, right now, fan going. I know um, Matt mentioned tight end seven on F- FFPC. When I'm looking at where he's going right now, he's at a tight end 10. So he's in that range. You know, like like Matt said, he's on the the, the back end of those tight end ones. Dan, for you, is he in the H's, as, as you call it? Is he in that <laughs> H zone? Because I kind of feel like he is, no? He, he's below the H zone for me. Um, I, Bobby and I are wearing the same pair of jorts here. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, it, I, I, I don't have a lot of faith in Locke. Um, uh, I, I just, I think he's a little bit overrated for fantasy, the same as Bobby does. Um, uh, you know, all those target or all those weapons there, uh, that he's got to, to choose from, you know, I, I'm just not sure that offense can stay on schedule enough to, um, get the long drives it's going to take to re- really generate the amount of targets it would take for Fant to pay off that price. You know, if Fant was going at, you know, a tight end 13, 14, something like that, I'd be all over it. But at tight end seven, no, a hard pass. And I don't mind him at tight end 10, honestly. I mean, the article might be, might flip over to the breakout side if we're going to classify it as a top 10 tight end. Because, you know, he had a 16.7% target share last year. Like I said, I think that is probably going to drop with the addition of Judy and the the other guys there. Um, But that's kind of the threshold that I found in terms of target share. It was about 17.5% of of the team's targets. Uh, And if you weren't getting that, then you were having a really tough time finishing as a top six. But as a top 10, you know, sure. I mean, I, I don't have as much of a problem with that, I guess. I've talked about it. Uh, Fant is a guy I was selling uh, this offseason. Not that confident in lock, similar to Bobby. And I, again, because he's kind of in that back end of, of the tight end one, the way I approach the, the position, as I've mentioned many times, is I'm trying to hit one of those monsters at the top. And if I don't, I'm going to pair up, you know, two or three guys uh, in the Ian Thomas, John U. Smith range uh, past the H's, as Dan likes to say. So, Nice little tight end combo. Let's jump into an offense that maybe the optimism isn't necessarily there, but the one of their main weapons, the optimism is definitely there. And Bobby feels that uh, that's no reason to shy away. Why don't you talk about your boy F1? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys have seen, uh, since this article has come out, apparently it's been like into hype Terry McLaren. So I'm glad that I did it before uh, it really became in fashion. I don't know. I'm not saying I'm a trendsetter. I'm not saying I'm not a trendsetter. <laughs> but I've heard people talk about, like, I literally saw a tweet today that was like, it's really in fashion to hype up Terry McLaurin. But at the same time, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. I'm still going to tell you to do it anyway. Like, they were calling out everyone else for hyping him up, but still saying they're going to do it anyway. Um, so I've written this article. It's a series now, and it didn't really initially start as a series, but the past t- three years I've now written this article called Buying High on a Young Receiver. And the premise isn't that difficult to grasp. It's that when these young receivers have a good rookie season, and I recognize that McLaurin is not as young as the other two I highlighted, but when they have a good season, if they have a good sophomore season, they actually go way up in ADP. It's just a trend because we tend to overvalue youth rightly or wrongly. So the two guys that I wrote about before was Juju Smith after Juju Smith Schuster after his rookie season and DJ Moore after his rookie season. And both times people are like, oh, they're kind of pricey for how much production I think I'm going to get out of them. But if at that time you spent like, let's call it 1.5 first, both have jumped to two first or even three first for DJ Moore. 
Um, so just showing that there is some value you can squeeze out of these young receivers still by buying in, even if it seems like a quote unquote late. And with Terry McLaurin, so as you said, Washington has all kinds of things going on, including a new name. And currently they're going by the Washington football team, super creative there. And I did just want to highlight though, that McLaurin got to 900 receiving yards as a rookie when he was playing with, Case Keenum, Colt McCoy, and Dwayne Haskins. And the other players in the last 10 years to get to 900 receiving yards as a rookie are Odell Beckham, Michael Thomas, Amari Cooper, A.J. Green, A.J. Brown, Mike Evans, Keenan Allen, Kelvin Benjamin, Sammy Watkins, Mike Williams, Julio, Julio Jones, McLaurin, Schuster, and Metcalf. So outside of really Benjamin and Watkins, you can say that all those guys have either become fantasy studs or are on their way to becoming fantasy studs. So it's a pretty good company to find yourself in. And if you listen to, I don't know if it was our most recent episode of Zuperflex. I believe it was the second most recent, right, Matt, where we talked about Paskins. Mm -hmm. That was with uh, Russell Clay. Sure. Uh, so if you listen to that episode, <laughs> you'll hear uh, Russell and Matt talk about how they still have some faith in Haskins. And what's really interesting, actually, is if you look at the splits, everyone got kind of down on McLaurin towards the end of the season last year because he started off really hot and then kind of cooled once Haskins started starting, which was surprising because they worked together in college. But the splits show a totally different story, which is more or less that he was the same exact player as he was with uh, McCoy and Keenan. He just, or, sorry, McCoy and Keenum. He just scored less touchdowns. So if he can get in the red zone a bit more and do what he just did with Haskins, we'll be loving on him. If Haskins improves at all, which I think is a great possibility, then McLaurin will also zoom up the ADP, even if he was a little bit older on the uh, rookie side. Yeah, this guy, like his first six weeks, he was a wide receiver, won 20%. Like his first three weeks, he went 23 points, 17 points, 19 points. Like he came out like gangbusters. Matt, are you on board with uh, with F1? Is he someone that you were maybe buying when he was at a lower price? He's going about wide receiver 19 when I'm looking at FFPC startups right now. What are your thoughts on uh, the receiver out in Washington? Yeah, Washington was a team for a long time. It was just an organization where I felt if it if I just avoided every player from that team, I'd be just fine. You know, I, we can throw in, you know, some other, some other teams in there too, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I, I kind of do like what they're doing now. I like Ron Rivera. He's kind of turned around or, or at least maintained some level of success for, for every league, every team he's, he's coached. Um, so I like all that. I like that uh, McLaurin is definitely going to be the alpha there. I do take a little bit of uh Umbridge with the fact that he's a young receiver. He's young in terms of being a second year player, but he's going to be 25 in, in September, which is not, not young for a second year receiver at all. Um, uh, so I think he's, I think he's, I think tied in 19 is like, right. It is pretty perfect price. So I don't know if I would really necessarily be buying him at this time. I do think there's enough questions still with that team in general that, uh, well, he's going to get the, he's, he's going to certainly going to get the targets. He's probably going to, I would guess be in that 120 plus target range this year, depending on, on if Haskins can take over that job. And, and I mean, for me, that's another concern. We, we've talked to death. Ryan McDowell, in fact, put out a tweet today about, Hey, have you guys heard that, that COVID situation? situation might affect the development of rookies and uh you know haskins isn't a rookie but you know another a, a full off season as the as the starter would have been very beneficial to him i think so mm -hmm. he's not going to get that but he does already have that you know again that chemistry back from college uh with mclaurin so i, I like all that uh I, I just think he's appropriately priced and i, I don't i'm not opposed to buying him but if, if somebody came along that was really you know excited to have him as a as a as a you know top top end wide receiver too I, I think i'd probably be okay selling at that point you know anywhere like a a, a mid early to mid first it, it would would definitely get me to get off of mclaurin pretty easily i think yeah then I, I feel like we like we've done a couple startups together on the ffpc and uh just in, in drafts overall i feel like he always just goes like just ahead of where i want to grab him how, how do you feel about him i know geis is a guy we like in that office in that offense is f1 a guy that you've been buying or that you're interested in right now at his price 
I'm kind of on the fence with uh, McLaurin just because of the fact that he, you know, as Matt pointed out, he is a little bit older than most second year players. And also the fact that he's really kind of the only game in town right now. And I don't expect that to continue long term. As far as receivers, who else does Washington really have? You know, it, it, it's it's hard to envision that they're going to allow that to continue. I mean, they could, heck, they've even made noise about uh, signing Antonio Brown. You know, and what <laughs> what would that do to uh, to McLaurin? You know, I, I I I like a lot of things about McLaurin. I like the fact that he's a he's a hardcore football player. He studies all the time. I mean, you know, he's one of those he's one of those gamers. And I never mind having those kind of guys on my team, you know, guys who just love the game of football and they're constantly studying it. They're constantly uh, looking for ways to improve. And that's that's everything that McLaurin's about, um, you know, so I'd never sell low on him. But, um, you know, if, if somebody wanted to offer me a, a really high price for McLaurin, I, I probably <laughs> would take that high price. Getting attacked by fruit flies over here. <laughs> <laughs> Why are um, there flies in here? Yeah. <laughs> See my frog tongue just like so, <laughs> what they call French people frogs. Isn't that a thing? Yeah, yeah you, you might know that. <laughs> so I actually forgot to ask Matt um, if you, if you had to compare Fant to an animal, what what oh, animal would you, what, what animal would you compare him to? Oh man, I actually did not prepare for this, so I. Uh, how, get, come back to me, and I'll, I'll have one for you by the end of the show. Bobby, right? do you have one for uh, <laughs> F1? Does he does he uh, remind you of a, a specific animal? It could be. So I actually didn't, but it could be because you were just talking about frogs. But I'm going <laughs> to say that he is a frog, and particularly like one that you hear in the dead of night that's just – especially because – so he's Scary Terry, right, or F1, as some people like to call him. So he's one you hear in the dead of night just like croaking, and if you're – a fly you're terrified because scary terry the frog is coming for you and if you're a wide receiver who's like kind of on the edge of being a wide receiver too but you're on the older side he's about to leapfrog you so you're definitely afraid of him too. i like it i like it that's a good one there bobby, go. bobby frogs are not scary okay bobby, frogs, <laughs> frogs aren't scary buddy listen if you are in the dark I, by I, I yourself. was going to say he did no, specify I was stop. in the dark. If you're stop. in the dark by yourself, pretty much any noise that you don't expect is terrifying. I stand by it. All right. Okay. Well, okay. We, we need to remember that we can't talk about to Bobby about animals and terrifying because, <laughs> you know, he's, he's self-admitted terrified of all animals. So <laughs> if it's Matt, not a puppy, it's scary pretty much. There, there you go. Matt, I'm just checking in. Do you come up with anything or should I go to the next Let's let's come back to it. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm checking some things out. <laughs> All right, Dan. We, we've talked about this site, uh, the FFPC, man. They got two huge tournaments right now, half a million dollars. I know we've all, all been cooped up. We're, we're starting to get a little loose. You know, we, we, we hopefully we're putting our masks on, but we're heading out there, getting social a little bit, keeping distance, but, you know, trying to, trying to let loose a bit. You know, what better way to plan than a live draft in Vegas Dan, you know all about these. We we actually met down in Vegas at one of these uh, a couple of years ago. It's just a ton of fun. You can do these online and you can do them live. But uh, why don't you uh, give the people a, a bit of a picture of that live event out there in uh, Vegas? Yeah, there's really nothing like it. I mean, it's it's just an event from start to finish. Uh, there are people that are you know we're we're doing some drafting on even you know Wednesday night, Thursday during the day before the first game even happens. And uh, then on Thursday night, there's a big viewing party. And, you know, they have this giant TV screen that's just like floor to ceiling in one of the uh, convention rooms. And er er everybody's there, just a great place to network and uh, get to know a lot of uh, fellow fantasy uh, fanatics. And then you get into the drafts and they're just like nothing else because you're sitting around the table with 11 other people. And it's a live draft, just like it was, you know, when you very first started with fantasy football, probably, uh, you know, with a bunch of your friends. But, uh, you know, now you're playing for, you know, basically a half a million dollars. So it's uh, it's very intense and it's a lot more fun when you can look your competitors in the eye rather than just kind of, uh, you know, be in the same chat room or whatever with them. And uh, you really you make a lot of friends. I mean, I went down there, I, I think, five, four or five years ago for the first time. I knew nobody basically. Now I go down there and it, it's like it, I, I'm cheers. Con- 
Yeah, it's kind of constantly talking to people. Me. You know, it, it it's just you know friends after friends. You know, I'm I'm watching the games with people that you know that I I really enjoy hanging with, and uh, it's just a ton of fun. I mean, if if you go down there, you'll be hooked. You'll be going down there every year. You just reminded me, Dan, that Thursday night party was uh, uh, New England KC, and that's okay. when Kareem Hunt made his introduction to the NFL. And I just remember the live drafts the next day on the Friday. He was going 101, 102 in those startups, like, you know, the 1250 buy-ins, those, those yeah. big ass buy-ins. People were just like, all right, I'm going Kareem Hunt, baby. Oh, that was funny because, you know, we we had the big auction in the morning right after that, uh, the $2,500 auction. And me and one of my very good friends who also is in that auction, and he and I are, you know, like our biggest rivals too. We were we were bidding up Kareem Hunt, and it was like who blinks first on that one. And it was insane, you know. We we do the the loser was going to get uh, whoever was the who was the top running back besides that at that uh, that Zeke year. was there. Yeah, Zeke. You know, so it was like you had, you know, it was like one of us was getting Kareem, the other one was getting Zeke, and everybody else was just kind of watching on the sidelines because we decided already that, you know, if if I was going to beat Jack or if he was going to beat me you had to have one of those two players. So it was, uh, it was good fun. And we were playing each other that week. So there was a lot on the line. Whoever got Kareem Hunt in his 50 points, you know, was almost guaranteed to get that win against, you know, your biggest rival. So ton of fun with that. Yeah. They're ton of fun. And like I said, if, if you can't make it to Vegas, uh, you're still a little hesitant to travel. You can still do it live from your own home, from the comfort of your home. Like I said, guys, half a million dollars, you're playing fantasy football and there's a, the football players, uh, championship the football guys and they've got their main event so two tournaments two different price points and don't forget the best balls the dynasties it, literally any type of fantasy you want to play against the best right here uh, at myffpc.com so check it out guys we uh we're gonna we're gonna jump out of the market really quick just because we are on a bit of a schedule and uh we, we we have like a couple you know some trades some some things to talk about Matt, I know you mentioned, so we, <laughs> I was saying earlier, you and I are in, in Pigs 3 together and, and we, we chatted a, you know, a few times in, in the DMs and it, it took me a while to put two and two together that it was like, you know, the Matt Price, that I, you know, the voice that, that I knew. I was trying to remember the other, other day if we actually got a trade done when we were, remember we were talking with tight ends or did I end up getting that done with, uh, with Tyler? Uh, I think we, I don't remember exactly. I'm pretty sure we didn't. I pulled up all the trades I've made okay. this off season and I don't see one from us, but I know we had, you know, quite a bit of discussion about it. Yeah. 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 That, that pigs league is definitely an interesting one. So why don't you start it off? You, you said you, uh, you had, you, you made a lot of moves this off season mm-hmm. and pigs is definitely an interesting league with the settings and so on. Uh, why don't you throw one out there for us? Uh, yeah, I made a, a, a bunch of trades this off season. I, I, I was, the startup uh, did not. Well, I, th- I thought it was going to go real great, but I, I typically will build my teams, especially in a, in, a, in a league like this, very, very top heavy. And when you have injuries or one or two of your players in your startup that you're counting on doesn't uh, doesn't quite work out. Thanks a lot, Rob Gronkowski. It, uh, it it can it can be bad. So I would basically went into rebuild mode last year, and then this and I acquired a, like a, just a ton of picks. I think I had five or six sets of of, of picks. And this is a bankroll league. Uh, if you guys aren't aware, basically you, you you and it's an auction league. So you get these draft picks. They convert to auction dollars, and they roll over each year. Um, it's not like you your rookie draft your rookie auction. You use it or you lose it. Th- this money rolls over year to year. And there's there's a decent amount of infl- <clears throat> excuse me inflation in these leagues. Scott has been trying to, to fix it with taxation and a bunch of other stuff. So just because you have a first round draft pick uh, in an auction league does not, or say, say you have the 101 in terms of draft picks that converts to auction money, you're probably not going to get the 101 player for that, that that one pick. So you need a lot of picks. So that's what I did. I acquired, I think, five or six sets of uh, full sets of picks. Um, I also had Christian McCaffrey was kind of my own own piece. And to get some of those picks, I moved McCaffrey for Elliott and, and, and a full set of 2021 picks. Um, and then the big, the big move of the season was with John Bosch. Uh, I kind of gave... 
uh, basically two full sets of picks. Uh, so a first, second, third, fourth, and fifth for 2021 and Gerald Everett and picked up Alvin Kamara and George Kittle. Uh, so I paired those with those guys with Ezekiel Elliott, basically moved McCaffrey to get Zeke, Kamara, and, and Kittle the way it all worked out. Um, so I liked those two trades quite a bit. And, and I was able to pick up another quarterback, another running back later on uh, throughout the offseason, picked up Devontae Adams later for, for Ridley and Hunter Henry. So all of a sudden kind of went from a team that was rebuilding to a team that I think is one of the stronger teams in the league. Hopefully we have a 2020 season so we can we can see a play out. But uh, I feel like this team is pretty much turned on its head from where it was this time last offseason. Yeah, it's definitely a fun league, and, and you have so many different options on how you can, uh, you know, I came in and it was a dispersal draft, just two teams, two of us that were kind of, you know, bidding on these guys. And similar to you, just went top heavy, uh, got like Mahomes, you know, like pieces, pieces like that, and then picked up guys when they were cheap, and they've, they've built in value. But uh, I like what you did there. Like you said, that because of the action in this, in this league and the way the settings are, you can rebuild quickly, which I love those type of leagues. Those are my favorite type of leagues. So a lot of different moves that that Matt made there. I'm going to go to – sorry, I'm going to attack by the fruit flies here. Uh, Best Damn Dynasty, at Best Damn Dynasty, he sends us on the reg. Bobby, I'm going to go to you first. 12-team PPR super flex. Time to cash in on the peak, Zeke. So the one side is Zeke and Deontay Johnson. The other side, two mid-21 first, Debo and Monty. Honestly, that seems about right, but it also seems like he's maybe selling a little bit low um, just because I think if you waited until – I agree. I'm not saying it's not time to sell Zeke. I do think it's time to sell Zeke, but I think the time to do it is in season when he's dominating and you probably could have gotten a little bit more for him. I do like Debo, but after the uh, Liz Frank injury – you do have to be at least a little bit worried about Debo going forward and also just the additions they made to that offense. The first obviously have some chance of hitting, some chance of not, but they're at least insulated in value. And I know a lot of people, I personally am not, but I know a lot of people are pretty high on Deontay Johnson. So it just seems like by including him, like the package should have just been the package for Zeke alone. By including Deontay, it does make it seem like you're losing a little bit of value overall in that deal. Dan, how do you feel about this trade? It's it's pretty big trade right now on on Twitter. It's pretty even, like fifty two to forty seven percentage. Yeah, so I you know it just in a vacuum, I I'd lean towards the two picks in Debo and Monty over Zeke and Deontay. I've never been the hugest Zeke fan, so that definitely weighs into it a little bit. Um, I'm always a little bit concerned about uh, his off field antics and what goes on with that. And on the field, uh, you know, he's he's a creature of volume um which which is great because you know the cowboys keep giving him that volume and that's fantastic as long as it lasts um but i do feel like it is about time to sell zeke Uh, i do agree with bobby that probably you could get a little bit more in season you know and especially once people start talking a little bit more about the fact that you know zeke has already had covid and you know people talk about his immunity and all that kind of stuff i mean you know these kind of things are going to matter so um you know i've I, I, I do think it's a little bit the wrong time to sell. Uh, but if you are selling them now, I think it's a great price. Uh, you know, I'd feel very comfortable uh, getting that for uh, Zeke and Deontay. And, uh, you know, also like Bobby, I'm, you know, I'm not, I may be a little bit more of a Deontay fan than him. I think he's got a good shot. You know, I like what I've seen from Deontay, but a lot of people are trying to comp him to Antonio Brown. And it's just way, 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 way too soon for that. He's He's got a long way to go to to get to that level. Let's see him be a force with a healthy Juju, a healthy Ben, a healthy James Washington, a healthy um, uh, Connor. You know, there's a lot of weapons in that offense, so you got to wonder exactly what is Deontay's share of it going to be. You know, so for that reason, I, I I love the price. Matt, how do you feel about this? Uh, it's pretty it's a pretty big move. There's some decent pieces, significant pieces involved here. Yeah, it, it might be a cop out, I guess. But the only way I'm making this deal if I'm the Zeke owner is if I am not competing at all in in, in 2020. You know, I mean, maybe it's a hedge on that. There's not going to be a 2020 season. If that's the case, that's that's great too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think. I, I, I realize it's time to sell Zeke. We're getting to the end of that first contract, or, or I guess we already are at the end of the first trade. He signed the big contract, right? So, yeah, uh, so he's, you know, we, we've had 
in recent years had had not had a lot of success holding on to those guys, whether it's Todd Gurley or David Johnson or what have you. Uh, but that offensive line is still one of the best in the NFL. That passing offense is maybe the best in the NFL now with those three receivers adding adding CD Lamb this year. I just don't think there's any way you can stack the box against Ezekiel Elliott and hope to be able to defend that pass passing offense. So I think there's a chance that this is as good as Zeke has been. I think there's a, definitely a chance that he has his best season ever this this year and in which case i still think you're going to be able to sell him again for a similar price in 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 2021 now there's there's obviously the risk that if he doesn't if that if he doesn't live up to that or we don't have a season and he's just another year older then you lose some value there but you know i don't i want nothing to do with david montgomery i think he's purely a volume play i don't think he's talented enough to uh, physically talented enough to be a difference maker at the position for us. He's, he's to me, he's, you know, a little bit quicker version and has the same, going to have the same role basically as Jordan Howard, which again is fine, but he's not going to be somebody who's ever going to jump up in value. Really. I don't think, uh, and then Debo, I like Debo, but I don't think he's really necessarily the alpha there. And maybe they just don't have that alpha yet. Maybe they'll never have the alpha there. Um, but I think you're potentially giving up the two pieces in this deal that, will increase the most in value. Obviously, those picks are very nice, but if I'm competing this year, and that's really my goal in, 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 in you know in every league, every year, honestly, um, then I'm not going to give up Zeke uh, for, and a chance at a title for a couple of first-round picks uh, and two players that I'm not super jazzed about. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the, the key, right, is what you're doing with Zeke. Like, for me, Debo and those 21 firsts, it's a good time to buy them right now. Um, especially if you believe that Debo can be the, the the stud out in that San Fran offense. Monty, I think it's just, do you believe him in him or not? He's going to get volume, obviously. I think his ceiling is really capped, but Zeke is the big piece. And, and is it, the question is, do you sell Zeke in this package or not? I don't know that I would sell him now. Like you guys outlined, you know, wait till he's crushing because that Dallas offense should be bulldozing, uh, especially early in the season. And Zeke will be a big part of that. So maybe you sell him when, when he's uh, rolling in, in that sense. So, uh, I love the way you guys broke this down. Like I said, 53% in the favor of the Debo Monty side, 46.7% on the side of Zeke. Bobby, did you have uh, a trade or anything that you, you brought with you today? Your show and tell? Um, I didn't have a trade, but I have made trades in the offseason I can talk about. So one of them was uh, similar to what Matt was talking about. I'm in a 14 team auction league called Rec Bobby. So named by John Bosch because we didn't have a name for the league and he went such a narcissist, Bobby. Yeah, so let's call it the Wreck Bobby League. And the champion is called the Wrecker of Bobby. Um, I made a trade where I similarly, it was actually my first auction startup that I did uh, not coming in, having taken over a team. And I didn't do that well in the startup. And I sold off a bunch of pieces and I traded a bunch of rookie money for Baker Mayfield, because I really needed a quarterback. And I was happy at the price I got him, which was about $400, just to give you guys an idea. The year before, Kyler Murray went for about 600 something in the rookie auction. And it was this season, Joe Burrow went for, I think, 700 something. So I basically got Baker Mayfield for $300 less than Joe Burrow went for. And I had rookie money to spend and ended up with a bunch of good pieces, even though I had the third most money. I got uh, I got uh, Swift, for, or not Swift, for example. I got Taylor, uh, who was the main takeaway, and I needed some running backs too. And uh, just some other pieces that I was pretty happy to get. And death, I'm sure you guys know this, but death is a uh, key in 14 teams. And so I'm very happy to have come away with, I actually now have, Oddly enough, I ended up winning Justin Herbert, too. I more or less was trying to redline the other guy because I thought he was going too cheap, and I won him. So I now have four starting quarterbacks after not having, like, any. Uh, so I'll probably try to trade one of them away, but I can't get anyone to pay me anything for Matthew Stafford. I don't know if you guys have had success moving Stafford, or I'm probably just going to have to wait until the end season to try to move him because I will not move my boy Daniel Jones, Dan. <laughs> he is winning me that George bet. Take you're gonna, oh, make, man. Me, you're gonna make me look up where i bought uh, i can't remember if i bought or sold stafford but i know i recently did it but dan while i look it up you have anything to add or do you by the way to... that's also my only daniel jones share so that's why i will not <laughs> yeah, i heard you say that that that, that makes sense yeah you, d- you definitely don't want to be moving him if that's your only one for sure i that surprises me that you just can't move stafford for that much in a super flex i mean you know he was 
we did a couple of startups, uh, JD and I, um, and Stafford was kind of right up there with, uh, you know, he went not long after Matt Ryan and all that. I mean, I know, you know, he's what, 35 years old, 34, something like that. But I mean, quarterbacks are playing to 38, 39, 40. You know, I, how long is your window? By the by the time you have to worry about Stafford's age, he's going to be off your team probably. So He's only 32 also. He's 32 he's wow. forever. He's only 32 though, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Okay, so the, see, there you go. He's only, you know, I'm thinking he's 35, he's 32. So, he's, you know, he's he's got years and years in front of him. Uh, you know, and he might be getting out of Detroit after this year, and that might be the best thing for him. You know, so I I have a lot of interest in Stafford. I you know, if uh, if Bobby's Dan, do you want to take over one of the teams in my fourteen teams? I trade with you because <laughs> I have I have Daniel Jones. Just, just Baker for Mayfield. one day, I could take over that team, and then <laughs> yeah. So I have Jones, the deal for uh, you. Mayfield, Herbert, and Stafford, and I want to trade Stafford because my team is. Okay, I'll give you five coaches. first for him. Perfect. That's all I needed. <laughs> so I, I found the move. It was actually with Jerry, uh, our, our fellow GOAT, Jerry over at uh, Dynasty Warzone. And I sent him Lamar Jackson, Michael Gallup, and a third for Stafford, Nick Chubb, Adam Thielen, 2021 20, second, 2021 20, second. That's a lot to digest. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see anyone writing it down, so I didn't expect much back. I honestly <laughs> just heard you say you traded Lamar Jackson, and my brain just went, why? If it's a super flex, my brain literally just went, why? Yeah. Dan, did you have uh, did you have a trade, or do you, you want me to share one of my recent ones uh, from a couple of days ago? Yeah, I don't have anything like super recent. I don't I don't remember if we ever got around to talking about this one before. The the last one I made in the goat leagues was about six weeks ago. I finally got out from under Love Bell, who had been looking to get out from under for you know like almost since I acquired him. <laughs> but I got uh, I, I gave up uh, Love Bell and Jacoby Myers for Darren Waller. Uh, this is not a tight end premium, but, uh, you know, I, I still feel pretty strongly that Waller is going to be a big part of that offense and in, uh, in Las Vegas. So just being able to get out from love bell was like a fre- breath of fresh air. I'm guessing you guys think I probably undersold bell a little bit, but uh, let, me, let me have it. What do you think? Matt, I'll let you go first. Bobby, Bobby's like, I'll let Bobby go a second. He's, he's uh he wants to pile on Dan, so we'll let yep. you go first. Little appetizer before Dan can, gets. Can you the meal. can you tell me the other pieces one more time? I'm so sorry. I was uh, so it was, I, I, finalizing my animal for no offense for you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we got to get back to that. So we have we have uh, Love nice. Bell, Love Bell, and Jacoby Myers uh, for Darren Waller. Uh. I think it's fine. I think, I mean, if you, if you need a running back too, there's no reason not to just, I think, ride Bell out. He's certainly going to get the volume. Um, Waller s- scares me a little bit, you know, just because it's, he's a one year guy and they've added a bunch of weapons. But if you need a tight end, I don't think that's, I don't think the value is off at all. I'm totally fine, totally fine with that deal. Jacoby Myers is, you know, whatever. Maybe, maybe he hits, but pro- he's pro- probably not. So yeah. uh, I think that's fine. Yeah. Bobby, I know you were like chomping at the bit. So what, what's not, your take? Champion. Not really. It's more just uh, <laughs> I got so I had a startup this year, and I'm trying to pull it up real quick. I got a. Of course, the transaction history is not showing up, but I got all I know is I got Bell like incredibly late as my RB three, and I'm kind of with Dan that you should be selling, um, just because. I don't believe in Gates and I don't really believe in the Jets offense, which makes me feel really bad for Sam Darnold. Hopefully he can survive Gates and get an actual coach. Um, that said, you know, Darnold didn't really play a full season. So maybe he opens things up for Bell a bit by playing a full season. Hopefully I'm not a big Waller guy. Maybe that's why I was making a face because it's just hard for me to buy into these. And I know tight ends take a while to break out, but Basically, Waller was like the, we talked about Antonio Brown already, but Waller was the like, oh, Antonio Brown thing didn't work out. Now we're left with nothing. All right. Might as well try throwing this guy. Oh, he can catch. Great. Okay. But now we're going to bring in Henry Ruggs. We're going to bring in Bowden. We're going to bring in, you know, all these guys that at least in this draft class, a lot of people liked. And there's also just the fact that as accurate as he is, Derek Carr is still Waller's quarterback and I know he did well last year but if you think that rugs get some volume I just see it taking away pretty drastically from Waller so 
while I'm all in on selling Bell if you can, I just don't know if Waller is the price I'd be looking at unless you're in like, I'm sure, I know both of you guys, I believe, are in the Trade Addicts Leagues with the 1.75 tight end premium. If that's mm-hmm. the case, 100% sell Bell for Waller. If it's not the case, I wouldn't do it personally. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I'm not a Waller guy and I'm not a Bell guy, but just based on what is out there in fantasy land right now, I'd probably make the move Dan made and I'd sell Waller before the season starts. And I feel like that stock goes down a bit. So I, I like yeah. the move for Dan. I know Dan likes Waller, so I, I, I'm not going to fault I, him for the move. I love the move. That's- yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not as huge on Waller as, as some people are, but you know, I do think he's going to have a nice early season role. And that's kind of my thought is to to roll him point. after a Good few point. games. So. Yeah, to, to Dan's point, the whole COVID situation could make it so that the rookies totally. don't get as involved as we think they might, and Waller retains a lot of his role. It's actually a really good point. Yeah. So just two really quick one that I made uh, before we, we, we close this thing out. Same league, very active league. One of them was with Swag, our boy Shane. He sent me – he offered me this. I just accepted it because – he, he's asking for Cephas, uh, Quintus Cephas, who uh, Dan and I, our buddy Noah Riddell, uh, is, is a fan of. And I understand the upside, but I got him at 411 and he offered me Larry Fitz and a third, 2021 20, third. So it was just easy except for me. Mash except. Yeah. And I then, had no uh, idea where we were going with this. When you begin to trade with, I was talking about Quintus Cephas. I was like, so they gave you some like waiver money. Like, where are we going with this? <laughs> but it's just, you know, sometimes you get a gift, you know, that every once in a while. And I like those. It's a little trade, but oh, no. I, getting I, Larry Fitzgerald for Cephas is insane. I know <laughs> Fitzgerald is old and whatever, but that's just insane. Well, and a 2021 third, too. Yeah. Oh, I have to pay you on top of this for this guy <laughs> that probably belongs on the waiver wire. Uh, hey, Shane, I, you, I love you, buddy. Do not talk bad about Quintus Cephas. We can yeah. talk about that if you want some other he's, time. He's got opportunity, man. That's for sure out there in yep. Detroit. But so the other little move in here with my boy Nate at uh, Nathan underscore Pilmer, fellow goat, he sent me my boy Fuller, who I'm crushing on right now, and a third for Ryan Fitzpatrick in a second. And I'm loaded at quarterback. Like, I've got a million quarterbacks. So that's why I'm kind of moving Fitz while he's uh, still got a leg left. You guys have any thoughts on that? My thought is you're making me regret having sold Fitzpatrick for, like, a third-round pick, thinking, (laughs) okay, I'm getting out on this guy because I'm getting whatever I can before Tua replaces him. And here you are getting Will Fuller for him. I'm clearly (laughs) doing something wrong. Why why would you want to sell that which can never die? I mean (laughs) – Fitzpatrick just he he keeps coming back more often than the you know like a a Friday the Thirteenth movie or something like that. I mean you know you you keep thinking okay it's finally I I I killed it I ended this thing you know or the the long nightmare is over and then here comes Freddy again you know it's like this guy just keeps popping up on new teams or keeps popping up on the same team. I mean you just can't keep him down. He's just, it, it, no matter what you do to Ryan Fitzpatrick, he is going to come up and he's going to start. That's all there is to it. That's all you need to know. And he's going to do it again on another team. You know, there's no right. way he's not, right? Yeah, totally. He's definitely yeah. going to do Absolutely. it. He's definitely going to do it again. Totally. Matt, you have anything to add on that? Or? No, I, I like that a lot. Um, you know, I, I don't know how it's really going to shake out between Fuller and, and and Brandon Cooks necessarily. You know, we we t- we typically don't like having wide receivers. Uh, you know, their first year on a new team, they 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 tend to to drop off. But I don't think we can necessarily count Cooks in that. You know, we had uh, I think it was three four three one thousand yard seasons for four different or the the other way four one thousand yard seasons in a row for the three different teams something like that. So he has shown that he, the ability to to jump in on a new team and uh, you know grasp the playbook I guess right away and gel. And obviously he has a, a great quarterback there. So uh, you know both of them obviously have their concerns. I think what is a five concussions for Fuller uh, or sorry for for Brandon Cooks and we know the the 
to deal with with Fuller's injury history, but you can't deny the the chemistry and the rapport that they clearly have together, uh, Fuller and, and and Deshaun Watson. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see how that offense works out because then they have Stills too, another deep threat who you know he could, I think he can do a little little bit more underneath uh, than the other two can. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, they're they're stacked for that deep ball this year, um, and it'll be interesting to see how they work out. And I like Fuller as a buy. Now I was very anti Fuller coming out. I didn't really like his hands. I, you know his his his, his, his skill set seemed pretty limited, but you know where he's going now uh, in terms of price in the was a seventh eighth round something like that I, I think that's a much more palatable price than we were paying even just last year yeah and that's that's kind of it right that's where where his price is bobby uh, i was just gonna say to matt's point i so i've always loved brandon cooks he was uh one of my first dynasty rookie drafts picks and since then i've just kind of been in love with him and this offseason i bought him for like a bunch of mid seconds which i'm pretty happy with because if he emerges as deshaun watson's top guy that's gonna just make that price boom and i also have a ton of fuller so one way or another i think i'm gonna be happy but watch them both get hurt and it'd be still show yeah that would hurt dan and i because we're loving that both of those guys at their price right now and and i just need to let jd know that uh i do own fuller in the og and he is available so all right well come come at me bro we'll have to talk (laughs) brother so Matt Price, uh, like I said, man, one of my favorite voices, uh, one, probably one that I've uh, listened to uh, longer than most. And uh, I appreciate you coming on tonight, man. You're you're now one of my favorite dudes and, and one of my favorite league mates because uh, we, we have some pretty good convos in that pig chat. So I know you've got your animal ready. So before you tell the remind the people where to find <laughs> you and all the good stuff. Tell us your uh, your Noah fan animal. And I got one more thing to add to that. We do something called OTC. Over here, I'm going to give you Noah Fant or Waller. Which one? Which way are you going to go? Oh, geez. Uh, I think just on age, I would go. I would go Fant there. Um, but for 2020 alone, probably Waller. To be honest with you, um, and, and for the animal, I am picking a uh, a milk snake. That sounds weird, I know, but there are these animals that mimic. Uh, other animals that kind of make themselves look bigger and scarier than they than they really are. So Bobby would probably be fooled by this by this snake too. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a coral snake before, but they're very prevalent in uh, more tropical places. Uh, when I lived in Florida, they were they were a concern there. Um, very venomous snake, uh, and the way you kind of know you're looking at a coral snake is re- there's a there's a rhyme. I don't, you might have heard it: red, yellow, kill a fellow. If you see red touching yellow, then it's then it's a um, a coral snake, the the dangerous one, but milk snakes they mimic them and they have red next to black. So friend of Jack is is the saying. So Fant is is really harmless, but he's but he's mimicking a, a dangerous tight end for twenty twenty. Um, so he's a milk snake. Wow, that was awesome. To learn. <laughs> I, 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 just gotta, I, I just gotta I'm say, I'm blown away. I'm thoroughly yeah, impressed. That is awesome. I am uh, I'm very self deprecating because I'm not as afraid of animals as I make it out to be. But Matt did pick the one animal that I'm legitimately terrified of. Snakes <laughs> is like I will freeze up if I see a snake, or if you even mention there's a snake in the same area as me. Bobby, uh, remind the people where they can find your goodness, and uh, we appreciate you coming back, brother. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you can find both Matt and I on Zuperflex Pod, which we've referred to a few times. That's at Zuperflex, Z O O P E R Flex. And you can find my work when I write lately. I haven't had as much time as I'd like. Uh, Dynasty League Football. And as always, you can find me on um, Rec Fantasy on Twitter. That's R K E V Fantasy. And despite what I was talking about earlier with that league, I'm not a Twitter tough guy as much as John Bosch would like to sell you that false narrative. I, I was going to say earlier that that move I made with Fitz, uh, John Bosch is a guy that that trained me a bit on on pairing up picks with pieces that you want to move. And that, that's kind of where that Fitzpatrick move came from. So shout out to John Bosch with, with that. Dan, uh, we're, we're glad to have you back, brother, as as we do on the weekly. I mean, the guests tonight were just just, oh, man. just blowing it up. And uh, with the info, <laughs> remind the people where to find you and anything else you want to share before we close it out. Yeah, we are on a roll with guests, aren't we, man? It's it's just incredible. So thank you guys for being on. Uh, I am at Overhyped Sleeper. Drop the final E from Sleeper. And uh, yeah, I'm, I am ready for the season to start. I mean, I'm ready for any sports. I'm 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 going to be watching baseball tomorrow night. God dang it! So. <laughs> <laughs> you got a thumbs up from Bobby. 
I mean, come on, man. It's 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 like let's get some sports going here, and and football is is the number one sport. I I'm going on record. I'm going to say we're going to have a full season of NFL. So there you have it. I love it. I love the optimism. Yeah, guys, uh, thanks for coming on at Matt Price FF at Bobby Koch. Uh, you find these guys uh, and their goodness on DLF and, and on Zookeepers. Or on Zookeepers. See, I did it again on uh, Superflex. <laughs> and <laughs> we appreciate you guys tuning in uh, and sharing the goodness with us on the weekly. Make sure you go to myffpc.com for all the goodness with regards to the best site to play fantasy. Tag us on your trades, man. Whether it's at Overhype Sleeper, no E on the end, at Goat District, hashtag always be trading. If you're on the Instagram as the IG, as the kids call it these days, the IG, it's Goat District FF. You can find that uh, trades, all kinds of stuff on there, man. Keep wearing your mask. Try to keep it please. safe. Keep it kosher. Please, please wear those masks and uh, be safe, be happy, and we'll check you all later. District, you know the Pope listens. Dynasty, our religion, for the blokes missing on all of these trades, on all of these plays, on all of these grades. By the end of the day, y'all getting played. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex. Send the homie a text. That trash offers the best. You try to make it complex. Then they text you back. Now all of a sudden, they don't make any sense. <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy. Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy. These trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T district, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's the... And I always be trading. And I always be trading. Trading. And I always be trading. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Fish. You forgot to say that they could find pictures of dance in his shorts on your IG as well. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get a, we got to get a uh, Twitter handle for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the chair, like the chair, yeah, like, the like, like the potathon chair. Yeah. The, I just yeah. had to come in super confident. Cause I'm not going to lie. The trade for Deandre Hopkins after we made that bet was just a killer. Yeah. So that's, now, I, now I just need to hide right. myself. I forgot that happened like, after. Win. That's yeah. hilarious. I totally forgot about that. That's hilarious. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I still like the, you know, I, I, I still like the basis of your, your thought process on the bet that Kyler is a little bit overrated and Daniel Jones is a little bit underrated. And, you know, yeah. I think that, I think in a lot of ways that still stands. Um, so, you know, I, I don't feel like this is an absolute done deal or anything like that. I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, I've got a lot to be worried about. You got a lot to be worried about. So all I know is Bill O'Brien got a call from Dan and it was like, Hey man, can you sell DeAndre Hopkins to the Cardinals? <laughs> so I don't have to wear these shorts. And he's like, That's right. I got you. See, I, I feel it for David Johnson so that you can win this bet. D- Daniel Jones for me became a serious value as soon as the the schedule came out because everyone's like, "Oh yeah. my god, they got the hardest schedule, the hardest schedule." I was like, See, you don't even." It was, this was like back in I don't even know, like three months ago or something. It's like, how do you know, man? See, All here's the thing. I thought, I thought if they didn't get if they didn't get Hopkins, they were going to go out and draft somebody like C.D. Lamb. Uh, yeah. To be honest, so you know, I, I felt like there was help on the way one way or the other, but. Um, you know, getting Hopkins was definitely, you know, when you can get a, a player of that caliber and magnitude versus uh, somebody who's never played it down in the NFL. I mean, you know, what a what a massive upgrade. Maybe I just have my finger on the pulse, but every time I've written about someone recently, <laughs> they've risen in ADP. I'm just saying. <laughs> Terry McLaurin was like wide receiver 24. Now you're telling me he's 19. Yeah. Daniel yeah. Jones was like QB like 18 or something. And now he's like 13. I don't know, you know guys. I don't you know, know, in the in the high stakes circles, they're they're right on exactly the same track as you are, Bobby, uh, with both of those players. All I'm uh, hearing is I should take all my money from this job, Dan, and invest in the high stakes <laughs> leagues. That's that's exactly it. Come join I mean, us, you know. But I, I, I'm, to, sure, uh, I'm sure your wife won't, won't mind one little bit. It'll be fine. <laughs> no, it's it's not like we're about to close on a house on Monday and need like yeah. a single dollar. 
<laughs> but I, 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 I got to I got to jump over to the other pod guys, but thank you so much. I'm Thanks, happy to man. Come on, yep. come on anytime. You, uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, man. We'll have you back. Thanks a lot, brother. Cool. See you. Yeah, I got to head out too, guys, but this was fun. Thanks a lot, right. Bobby. Yep. Thanks, Bobby.